All right, so now that we have talked about primary visual cortex, we can talk about the other regions of the visual cortex. So the primary visual cortex is called that because that is where the first inputs from the, the thalamus uh, come into the cortex. Um, so that's basically the lowest level of cortex that does any visual processing at all. And then the uh, the rest of the cortical areas are named in a roughly hierarchical way. So V2, or secondary visual cortex, gets its input from uh, V1. Um, and this is in a monkey brain, but you can see V2 is basically um, just anterior to V1. And then there's V3, which gets its input from V2, and V4, and V5, and, and depending on the nomenclature, V6 and V7. But uh, all of these are just higher level regions of visual cortex processing. And there's a lot of uh, different circuits here, and it's uh, way more complicated than we're going to have time to get into. But there are basically two streams. Uh, there's what's called the dorsal stream, which is uh, a projection from V1 uh, to V2 and to areas like uh, this region called the uh, middle temporal area uh, and then the middle superior temporal uh, area and that's called the, the dorsal stream because roughly speaking uh, the regions that process that information uh, uh, are are in the dorsal aspect of the cortex whereas there's a ventral stream which includes again v1 v2 v3 and then a projection from v3 to v4 and then from v4 to this area called the inferior temporal lobe which is uh, named because it's on the inferior side of the temporal lobe and those two pathways, again, there's a lot of communication between the two, um, and they're involved in a lot of different aspects of visual processing. But uh, roughly speaking, uh, most of the dorsal stream regions are involved in uh, processing aspects of um, uh, Image process or image identification or object identification. So sometimes the dorsal stream is called the what pathway, and then the ventral stream, among other things. Uh, I'm sorry, the ventral stream is called the what pathway, and the dorsal stream because it is involved in processing motion, but also involved in things like navigation. Is sometimes called the where pathway. So again, the dorsal stream uh, starts with uh, projections to area MT, uh, also sometimes called V5. We know, uh, so if you if you uh, measure or record from neurons in V5, or if you look at uh, animals or people that have had damage to V5, for example, um, we know that this region is responsible for responding to motion. So if an object is moving across the visual field, areas in uh, neurons in area V5, respond to that. Many of them are also direction selective, so they prefer movement in a particular direction. When you go beyond V5 to area MST, for example, and other regions that get their input from these two, uh, you'll find neurons that are important for things like navigation. So uh, the way that you can know, can know that is by looking at um, you know, a person or an animal that has had damage to this region and giving them a task like navigating a maze or finding their way through a map, for example. And then uh, there are also uh, neurons in this pathway that are important for directing eye movement. So, so moving your eyes and pointing them toward uh, a, a visual cue involves the so-called dorsal strip. So again, that's, that's why uh, we uh, often listen to preferred see this referred to as the wear pathway because it involves motion and navigation uh, and so on. Uh, the ventral stream, meanwhile, includes area V4. Um, area V4 we know is important for color vision, so a lot of color and wavelength sensitive cells are in area V4. And then the inferior temporal lobe uh, also has color sensitive cells and you also see cells in area IT that have very selective receptive fields in terms of uh, shape and objects. So um, cells that prefer say circles and or, or triangles. Um, and uh, interestingly uh, in at least humans and primates 
we know that in area IT, there are face cells. These are cells or neurons that that respond very specifically to faces in their visual field, uh, in their receptive field. And so um, we know uh, this because uh, animals or people that have damage to this part of the brain can have what's called face blindness, meaning that they uh, have trouble recognizing uh, people's faces. Um, uh, these cells are, are very, very good at recognizing faces. Um, so good, in fact, that it's hard to turn it off. It's not just any face. Any Anything that looks even close resembling a face will activate these cells. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, we uh, probably see faces so easily. So um, you've probably seen pictures like this before. This is the so-called uh, uh, face on Mars. It was taken by one of the earlier Voyager spacecraft, so back when the uh, uh, photograph quality was much lower. And of course, you know, it kind of looks like a face. You've got maybe a little eye over here, maybe a nose, maybe a mouth. Um, more recent pictures have shown that it's just a mountain, that this particular picture and the way the shadow hit it kind of resembles a face, but it, it looks a lot like a face um, simply because of the combination of those shapes. And, you know, people who see uh, pictures of, of uh, faces in their food sometimes, uh, again, it's just that part of the brain being overactivated by a particular combination of, of light and shadow. Uh, this is one of my favorite um, examples of this. Um, by the way, the, the technical term for this is uh, uh, pareidolia. Uh, I think I'm spelling that right. Might be P-A-R-A. -P but anyway, um, uh, so I don't think anyone would have trouble seeing uh, the face of a guy with a beard and long curly hair in this picture um, with these two people standing maybe in the background. Um, but if we colorize the image, um, what it actually is is a, a, a family with a baby. And the guy's face is actually just the baby's body. The, the guy, the baby's face uh, is the guy's eye. Um, the, the baby's arm is the, the mustache and then the sort of um, greenery back here uh, in the background is forming his hair. But this image, I mean, even it, now that you know what it is, you can kind of force yourself to see the baby in the image, but um, that, that part of your brain that's very, very selective for faces uh, insists that there's a face there. So uh, that's just an example of how powerful these cells and how selective some of these cells can be. Now, of course, um, you know, we're, we're getting pretty far up into uh, really complicated aspects of, of visual processing. Uh, the fact is nobody really knows exactly how the brain is able to pull this off, how it's able to detect and remember and identify so many different images. Um, you know, faces alone are a pretty complicated thing to, to understand. Um, uh, so, so people that develop computer software, develop facial recognition software, have been trying to figure out how to do this for years and years. And, and actually, the technology is a lot better than it used to be. So now, for example, you can put your, your picture on Facebook, and Facebook will be able to, to recognize your face just from your picture. But that's that's only that technology has only been around for a few years and it's still kind of being perfected. But our brains are able to do this very early on, almost from birth. Um, and in fact, it's not just humans. Um, uh, a lot of other animals are, have shown to be able to recognize faces and, and recognize objects very easily. Um, so the question is, how is this done? And again, no one really knows for sure, but there are several different hypotheses for how the brain is able to uh, perceive objects so easily. Um, so one possibility is uh, what's called the grandmother cell hypothesis. So in this uh, uh, model, basically the assumption is that somewhere in the brain, there's a neuron for pretty much everybody you know. So, so for my grandmother, presumably there is a neuron in my brain that responds whenever I see her picture. Um, and that cell responds because it gets its input from a set, uh, a lower set of neurons that have slightly less complex or less specific receptive fields. Those neurons get their input from a slightly less receptive, uh, less complex set of neurons and so on. Uh, and so the assumption is that every single image is built up from more and more complex uh, receptive fields. 
um, and then uh, for any given object it's essentially sitting at the top of this um, uh, long hierarchy uh, and this may in fact be how some objects or some uh, uh, concepts are stored in the brain or how they're recognized but uh, you can probably see where this breaks down because it would be highly uh, unlikely or be very difficult to have an individual cell in your brain for every single person you know uh, and might and might see a picture of and uh, and for that that neuron to have this uh, increasingly growingly uh, growing complex uh, set of neurons below it to process that information um, not only that but uh, for any given face of course if you look at someone's face um, in different lighting situations or if they're looking at you in profile or wearing glasses or they uh, put on a different hat you can still tell that it's the same person and so that that would this model uh, where you have a single cell for each person doesn't really um, uh, deal with that situation. So this idea of parallel processing um, basically says that instead of there being a single neuron or, or population of neurons that responds to every possible face or every possible object you might see, different parts of the brain, uh, the visual system, process different features of an image and then uh, perception is not something that occurs at a single place or at a single uh, uh, group of cells but occurs across sort of a, a distributed network of cells um, all sort of activating at the same time and a given uh, different objects or different faces may uh, may involve the activation of different regions of the brain at the same time overlapping networks essentially um, being involved in the same uh, processing the same image uh, again the the actual mechanism for how visual perception works is uh, still one of those questions that no one really has a firm answer for but um, the the point is that it uh, there are there are some uh, interesting models out there um, and uh, perhaps I mean this you know when when we started talking about this uh, you know years ago uh, this is where the research was but maybe by now um, there's been more uh, recent work out there um, anyway that is the end of this chapter that's the end of the visual system so we will uh, move on next to the auditory system